You're watching the CV Church Sunday Message, a place to belong, believe, and become. Thanks for joining us. Would you take your notes out? And we are going to continue our series that I have entitled Dare to Believe. If you want God's blessings on your life, if you want the power of God in your life, we sang today about the God of miracles. If you want his presence to be demonstrated in and through your life, you will want to build these three foundational aspects of God's character. And I recommend you just write them across your notes there. Integrity, humility, and generosity. Integrity, humility, and generosity. And the Bible tells us that these are the three antidotes to the three greatest temptation in every one of our lives. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 says this. Do not love the world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world, here's the three temptations now, only offers, number one, a craving for physical pleasure. I put in a side note for you. That means it's driven by sensual and sexual desires. That's the craving. The word there is epithemia, which has to do with lust. What is the biblical response to that craving? Integrity. Let's look at the next one. There is, then the second thing the world offers is a craving for everything that we see. We call that hedonism. We call that materialism. And the principle, the foundational character that breaks that stronghold is generosity. And we'll talk about that today. And then pride in our achievements and possessions. That is the values of the world of conceit and vanity. And the value that breaks that stranglehold is humility. And then John says this, these are not from the Father, these three cravings. They are from this world. And this world is fading away because it's temporary, along with everything that people crave. Now notice this. But anyone who does what pleases God, they will live forever. Now this passage of scripture highlights the three great temptations in life and the three antidotes to these damaging and detrimental pursuits. In this incredible series, we're looking at the idea of dare to believe the key to miracles. Today and next week, I want to look at dare to be generous. We've talked about dare to imagine, dare to commit, care to believe, uh, what does faith do. Now I want to look at dare to be generous. In the Bible, there are over 7,000 promises. With every promise, there is a premise. What do I mean by that? God says there's a condition for every one of his promises that he has promised us in his word. There's promises for success, for satisfaction, fulfillment, blessings, healing, wholeness, reconciliation, and the rest. Every promise is somehow, church, connected to generosity. There are more promises related to generosity in the Bible than any other subject. Recently, I read a study that about the number of times certain words and important words are used in the Bible. The word believe is used 272 times. The word pray, important word, 371 times. The word love, we all know the importance of love, is 714 times. The word give is used 2,152 times. Now why? Because God is a giver. Everything you have in your life, church, is a gift from God. If God was not generous, you would have nothing. God is a giving, generous, healing, sacrificial God, and he wants us to learn to be like him and to imitate this trait of him. Now, as I talk about generosity, I'm not just talking about money. Most of you think that's what I'm going to talk about today. It's not just about money. It includes money. Jesus talked a lot about money in the kingdom of God. But I'm talking about being generous with your talents. I'm talking about being generous with your time and with your trust and with your touch and with your treasure and with your tithe. And what you've learned from your trials and your trauma, traumas 
and your troubles. All of us know that people who go through the most difficult things in life are usually a very rich reservoir of the wisdom of God. And we need to be willing to be authentic to be able to share that with everyone we come in contact with. So I'm talking to you about being generous with affirmations and with compliments. Why is God so interested in generosity? You might write this in your notes. Because generosity is love in action. For God so loved that he hoarded? No. No. God so loved that he was stingy? No. God so loved that he what? He gave. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You might write that down. You can give without loving. You can give with uh, strings attached. You can give because you're trying to manipulate and influence to get your way. But you cannot truly love without giving. Why? You cannot love without being generous. So we're definitely in the growth mode in all areas of the acronym we use, SURF. VIP, S-E-R-F-V-I-P, stands for your spiritual life, your emotional, your relational, your financial, your vocational, your intellectual life, and your physical life. In order to continue to grow, to become a local church that is missional in its orientation towards loving and serving and sacrificing and giving to our community, daring to be generous could not come at a better time for every one of us who called CV Church their home church. 2016, the theme the Holy Spirit has given us is to go deep and wide based on Colossians 2.7. As your roots go down deep into Jesus Christ, may your faith, he says, then go wide through the expression of serving God by serving others. So I want us to look at together and next week what happens every time you and I give. You've heard me say this. I have great passion for this subject. There's two kinds of people. We can break everyone down into one of these two groups. You are either a giver by orientation. And what I mean by that is when you're in a situation, you're, learning, you're, learning to, you're looking to give. You're not looking to take or receive. Or you're a taker. You're looking in every situation, what can I get out of this? How will this better position me? Does that make sense? I think if we're all honest, most of us would say, I think I'm a little more on the taking side. And God wants to do a miracle in our midst where he breaks that fallow ground deep down on the inside of us. It comes up as simple as if there's one chair and there's two to three people, you'd be the first one to offer it to somebody else. You open the door for other people. If you notice that you're talking too much or there's somebody in your group, I have great passion for this. You can ask people in my small group. I'm looking for the people who aren't talking because I want to make room for them. Why? Because every voice is important. We need to be generous in every area of our life. So let's look today at the first six benefits of being generous. Point number one, would you write this in your notes? Generosity honors God. Giving is an act of worship, and it recognizes everything you have as a gift from God. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13 and 15, as a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. Why? For your generosity to them and to all the believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Notice what he says. They will give glory to God for your ministry. What was their ministry? This, these, this Gentile church was being asked by Paul to support the Jerusalem church that was going through a famine. Notice that when you give of your time and you give of your talents, you give of your treasure and your tithe, God receives glory. Notice in this text, when Paul refers to their giving money in the relief effort, he calls it a ministry. Wherever you give to meet a person's need, and let me say it again, everyone in this room has spiritual needs, has emotional, has relational, has financial, has uh, vocational, has intellectual, and has physical needs. You're going to come in contact with them as soon as our service is over. 
Is your natural inclination to give, to listen? You can see someone's down. Do you move towards them or do you go, oh, man, I don't want to even get in contact with that. And you go the other way. See, all your, all your reactions to people's needs tell you whether you are generous at your core or whether you're a taker at your core. Look at Proverbs 14, 13. Would you read that out loud with me? Let's begin. Those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but helping the poor honors him. Now, I want to just take a moment to dote over you, CV Church family. We're able to give $10,000 so far to the Foursquare Church in Belize. I've already gone once. I'm going at the end of this month. In August, we're sending eight to nine of our youth and adults to go and partner with them and their youth ministry there. The LifeNet Foursquare Church is going to be a lighthouse to that entire nation. And we gave to them so far. As a church family, we've honored God greatly with not just our financial gifts, but the sending of people to be there and listen and to sacrifice and to care. And I'm terribly excited to tell you at the end of um, June in the first week of July, we're going to have uh, three of the team of Belize, and they're going to be speaking in our church. You will not want to miss them. Kidzai, Tanya, and Jesse, you'll, you'll, you'll never forget them, and they will change your hearts profoundly. If you'd like to be generous and honor God in donating the gift of a scholarship, you can make your check to CV Church, but make sure you put in the memo, Epic Youth Belief Mission. Then last week, <laughs> we had over 1,450 people at our, Sunday, at our Saturday's Easter egg hunt at Two Strike Park. For those of you that were here, you heard how you, God used the Easter egg hunt, a simple, silly, little Easter egg hunt to change and transform Dr. Bruce Stark's life and his wife and his children's life. We had four plus families from the Easter egg hunt come to church last Sunday. We had many more young families and their children. Hey, our kids' place had 72 kids last week. We, we should be averaging 72 to 100 kids. And you're going to hear me say this more and more. But it's going to take more of us adults to get involved. So let me just say, if you have an adult, a, a child in kids place, I'm asking you to go to Beth and say, how can I get involved? Did you know it takes 80 to 100 adults in one month to make kids place go? We had over 100 volunteers at the Easter egg hunt. Why? Because I believe God is communicating to us, and we're starting to listen, some of us. We're daring to be generous. We're daring to give of our time. That when you greeted the people of our community, that God was honored, and that God was planting seed in people's hearts. We have planted thousands of seeds I'm excited to see what Jesus will do. And remember one of the principles I just taught recently. When you plant, you don't go the next day and expect the harvest. There's always a time delay, right? You plant your seed, and you might water it, you might fertilize it, but for crying out loud, you don't dig the seed up. Leave it alone. That is God's work, isn't it? So the first benefit to being generous is God is honored. Look at number two. Would you write in your notes there, generosity draws me, you, closer to God. Why is this true? Because whatever I invest in is what I'm committed to. Whatever and I invest my time, whatever I invest my infections, whatever I invest my finances to, that's what I'm truly committed to. If I invest my time in something or my money in something or my energy, it could be golf, it could be shopping, it could be a business plan. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, but it does show what's really truly important to me. When I invest in God and his work and what he's doing in the world and in our community, it not only honors God, but church, it draws you and I closer to him because where my money and time go, that's what attracts me, what touches me, and what fires me up so much about that Easter egg hunt is there was over 100 of, of you. It was more important that you spent time reaching out to our community than going to the beach or going and doing something else. You were willing to sacrifice your time. God sees that. And I believe God smiles over us 
any time you choose to be generous instead of choosing to take. Does that make sense? Deuteronomy 14.23 says this. Bring this tithe. What's tithe? It's 10% of what I make to the designated place of worship. The place the Lord your God chooses for his, notice, for his name to be honored. And eat it there in his presence. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, the firstborn males of your flocks and herds. Doing this will teach you, notice what he says. Giving your tithe to the local storehouse where you attend will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. Now, obviously, the Israelites were an agrarian people. So the tithe of their grain, new wine, olive oil, firstborn, for, uh, male uh, goats, that was their compensation. That was their paycheck. For us today, we're taught in Scripture to bring our tithe to the local church where we call home. Why? It's first how we honor God. Secondly, we draw close to him through all the benefits that we receive from being part of this church family. I'd like you just to think, if you're a member or you're a tender, what are, what's the value, what's the benefits that you get from identifying with this local church? The first question I ask when we offer Life Development 101, which is our membership seminar here, and if you've not uh, taken that yet, I encourage you to come and join me on May the 22nd. Uh, if you've already been to Life Development 101 and you've signed our membership covenant, then you go to 201. You learn this, the disciplines of spirituality. Then you go to 301. You learn how you're shaped by God to serve. And then 401, you find your place in the global kingdom of God's mission. But the first thing we talk about in uh, Life Development 101 is, is what? I had a great thought. It's not in my notes. Well, you'll have to come back to me. When I give of my tithe every week, and just so you know, I, I tithe every week. What I do is I can f figure out, I'm not there yet, I can figure out pretty much what I'm going to make in a year. I divide that into 52 just because I want to impress into my nervous system every time I gather with God's people, I'm giving. Now, you know, when I come, I don't just give of my finances. I'm giving of my time. I'm giving of my talents. I'm giving of my energy. I, I do all of those things. And it allows then me to grow closer to him because I'm supporting his purposes and plans for the CV church. Now listen, I know this is difficult for many of us, and I don't talk about it much, but I felt like I needed to today. Tithing is one of the most equity-driven concepts in the Bible. What do I mean by that? Regardless of what you or I earn in a year, God asks for the term, ten, first 10% of my earnings to go to the local church. Now listen. You might think churches are looking for huge givers. I'm not. I'm not looking for some sugar daddy or mama that will come in and can place a large check. Because why? Then our trust goes in people. What do I mean by equity? Whether you make a million a month, a hundred thousand a month, a thousand a month, a hundred a month, ten a month, or a dollar a month. A person that makes a dollar a month, ten cents, is a stretch. If you're making $100 a month, $10 a stretch. If you're making 1000 you can do the math. When God's church does what they're supposed to do and we just humbly submit ourselves, there will always be what needs to be here so we can continue to minister to our community and around the world. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not going to come and huff and puff and blow your house down. Okay, we, we have records. I can pretty much tell who is and isn't, and you will never, ever, ever will you see me treating somebody different because of what they give or they don't give. Why? Because that's a lack of integrity. But the scripture says this. When I don't give to the storehouse and I don't tithe, I'm robbing from him. And he is the ultimate bookkeeper. <laughs> isn't that good? 
He's the ultimate bookkeeper. Go to number three. Generosity makes me more like Jesus. The most generous person who ever lived, of course, was Jesus Christ. He sacrificed his own life for us. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It's on the PowerPoint. Would you read this out loud with me? Let's begin. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. By saying Jesus became poor, Paul is referring to Jesus giving up his rights as God and becoming a human being. In his incarnation, God voluntarily became man, the person, Jesus of Nazareth. As a man, as a man Jesus was subject to place, time, and other human limitations. But he did not give up his eternal power when he became human. But he did set aside his glory and his rights. In response to the Father's will, the limit, he limited his power, he limited his knowledge uh, to do the Father's will. Christ became poor, and when he became human, he set aside so much. Yet by doing so, why did he do it? Paul says to make us rich. Not rich financially, but rich in that we could receive salvation and eternal life. And the scripture says we're going to rule and reign with him one day. Did you know every time you give of your time and of your energy and of your attention and your money and your talent, you become more like Christ? Remember what I said at the beginning. At every situation today, as we get up and we leave this place, you're going to have an opportunity to give someone or to take from someone. What do you do? Every time you give, you become more like Christ. Look at Proverbs 21, 26. It says this. Some people are always greedy for more. You can see them at food lines. <laughs> Especially buffets. You can see the greed come out in people, can't you? It's not just about money. Have you ever thought of someone when you sit there and you see them suck up the oxygen in the room because they're asking all the questions, they're the one talking about all their hurts and all their pains, and they do all the talking. What are they doing? They're taking they're taking. It's a real skill to learn when you're with people to serve up questions to them that allows them to share who they are, that you get to know them, that you're more concerned about them than you are yourself. The more you become like Christ, you look intentionally for opportunities to give the love of Jesus Christ Away. Let's go to uh, point number four, slide 18, please. Number four is generosity is the cure for materialism. So we see that generosity honors God. It draws, draws me close to God. It makes me more like Christ. Number four, generosity is the cure to materialism. Materialism is all about getting. Get, 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 get. Get all you can and can all you can get. Materialism is about taking in and acquiring and hoarding so I have more and more. Now, church, please hear me. The only antidote to that craving for materialism is to give, give, and give. Now, you might be sitting there and going, you know what, Scott? I'm not very materialistic, but let me care front you this morning. If you are not looking for every opportunity to give, you are materialistic. Yes, you are. Because the only antidote to materialism is that every time you give, you break the grip of materialism on your life. You break it. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 24. No person can serve two masters. For you're going to hate one and you will love the other. You will either be devoted to one or you will despise the other. And then he ends this with, you cannot serve God and money. In your notes there, I have that scripture. Would you just circle the word cannot? Jesus didn't say you should not serve both because he said you can't. It is in an impossibility to serve God and money. Jesus said you can't have two gods in your life. 
You've got to decide what's more important to you, being rich or serving God. What's more important, God being number one in my life or is money number one in your life? Listen, in a consumer-driven culture, and especially here in L.A., it's pretty hard not to fight materialism. Would you agree? When you, I look at my neighbors on my left and right, they've got every gadget um, uh, uh, imaginable. You know, if I compare my self-worth to what everybody else has on my block, I am pond scum compared to the rest of them. Thank God my identity and my self-esteem is not measured by that. It's measured by the love of God. It's measured what God did on Easter. When Jesus had his hands nailed to the cross, he goes, this is how valuable you are to me. This is how much you matter to me. Not what you have in your bank account. Not what kind of IQ. Not what kind of school you've gone to. It's you. First Timothy 6, 17 and 19. Paul nails this. Teach those who are rich in this world. You might just look at the person on your left and right and tell them you're rich. He's talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I told you this. My last trip to Belize, I went to some of the friends of the church. They don't have running water and they don't have toilets. They go outside and they squat in a hole. We should never, ever think that we're poor. Even the person here with the least amount of money, you're wealthier than probably over two-thirds of the people in the world. So he's talking right smack dab to us. Yeah, but Scott, I don't have three cars, and I don't have a 6,000-foot square house. Well, poor little you. Uh. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money. I love this, which is so unreliable. It can be here today and gone tonight. Their trust should be in God. Why? He's the one that richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. So God isn't against us having things. He wants us to enjoy them. But he says, tell them, use their money to do good. They should be, notice this now, he's a play on words. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, you store up treasure in heaven as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Now, Kathy and I, ever since we've hit 2016, we've just been running full bore. We have a full life. And on this last weekend, it was just like that, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we went and went and went. By the time Easter services, the third one was done, uh, my energy was spent. But guess what? We had invited 18 people over for dinner. No, no, I, I'm not asking for any kudos. Don't say anything to me going out the door. I don't need any pats on the back. Why did we do that? Because we know that the way we break materialism is you don't sit there and say, I've done enough. I can kick back. You give and you give and you give. Materialism, I want to call it, it has a demonic life behind it. You've got to strangle it to death and then put your foot on its head, and then you have to take a knife and cut it off. Yeah. It has an uncanny ability to revive. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So we do what we do because we know if we don't keep giving, then we're going to become takers. And I refuse to become a taker. I want to be a giver. Why? It's the only cure for materialism. Look at number five. Generosity demonstrates my faith. In other words, every time I give, it demonstrates my faith. Every time one of you grabs me by the arm and says, can I have a few minutes? That demonstrates my faith. Every time I get emails, hey, would you please answer this? Hey, can you please come do this? Hey, can you please do this? And I listen and I go ahead and I do it. I'm demonstrating my faith. When I give of my talents, when I give of my my uh, vocation, when I give of my finances, when I give of my physical life, when I give of my intellectual life. I love to see each one of you thrive. You want to get me going, tell me you have, you have a chronic stomach ailment. That fires me up. I can help you with that. 
This is a little crass. You got problems with constipation? I'm the doctor. <laughs> I can help you. Because I've watched people go sick and die because of it. I love to demonstrate uh, faith that way. Now, I'm going to ask you to take, if you'd like to celebrate communion, would you keep the cracker and the bread? The, uh, do, do not eat it yet. We're going to take it together, and we're going to do it a little differently. I put it down there so I wouldn't spill it. How smart am I? Look at 2 Corinthians 9.13. This is in the Phillips translation. Just stay focused with me here. Your giving proves the reality of your faith. Isn't that interesting? Your giving. Look at Philemon 1.6. Paul writes this. And I am praying that you will put in action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Church, the purpose of this series is to build your faith so that you would be willing to trust Christ and give to him all of who you are and you're willing to give yourself away for his purposes and his plan. Now, listen to me, church. I want you to write this down. Stinginess is caused by unbelief. Would you write that down? If a person next to you isn't taking notes, write it on their forehead. (laughs) Stinginess is caused by unbelief. I don't really believe that this is what it's saying. I really don't believe that God can take care of me. I don't believe that if I give this away, if I give my time, I give my talents, I give my tithe, I give my treasure, God's not going to take care of me. I don't believe that. I have to care for myself. That's worry, church. That's not faith. That's anxiety and fear. That's not that. And that's unbelief. Stinginess is caused by unbelief. Your generosity is because of your faith. Look at this in Malachi 3.10. This is really clear. Bring your whole tithe, that's 10% of my income, into the storehouse. Test me in this and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much a blessing that you won't have enough room enough for it. God says this, I dare you. I dare you to test me on this. I've been a tither since I was nine years old. You do the math. I'm 61. I've been doing this for 52 years. And I can tell you, he passes the test with flying colors every time. God cannot be outgiven. This is the only place in the Bible that you can prove that there is a God. Now, I have my master's in theology. I've done a little bit of study. I know the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. There's the cosmological argument, there's the teleological, there's the ontological argument, there's Kant's moral argument. But isn't this strange? In the Bible, it says that if you you can prove that God exists by tithing and see if he doesn't bless you more. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that frosts me. He says, Scott, if you want to know I really exist, I challenge you, son, you give. And I've been doing that for 52 years. And he's, I've lost to him every time. (laughs) Giving demonstrates my faith. Here's the last point for the day before we celebrate communion. Generosity reveals my character. In other words, whether I am stingy or generous reveals what kind of heart I have. It shows, do I have a selfish heart? Or do I have an unselfish heart? Do I have a generous heart? Or do I have a stingy heart? Many of you during our Easter, there were several of you that really just stood above the rest. You told me you didn't have the time. You told me you didn't want to. Come Easter, you were there with a smile on your face. And you did it because you knew it was the right thing. And I salute you. I can't tell you how much I do because I know it's the right thing. There's a lot that I do. I don't necessarily like it. But I do it. Why? Because it's the right thing. And because I know that giving reveals my character. Do you have a generous heart? Or do you have a stingy heart? Giving generously shows what my heart is really like. In Luke 16, 11, Jesus said this. And if you are untrustworthy with worldly wealth, who's going to trust you with the true riches of heaven? 
I want to take, I want to close now. Conchita, I'm closing. Uh, would you go to uh, slide 30? As we come to the communion, I want to ask the worship team, please come. We're going to do something a little different. I want to share with you 2 Corinthians 8, 9. I've already read it to you, but I want to read it again. As we come to the communion table, as we come to the cup, thank you, and as we come to the bread, these two symbols explain how Christ became poor. By becoming one of us and by shedding his blood on the cross for our redemption and our forgiveness, he became poor so that we could become rich in salvation. I'm going to ask you to join with me. You can take whatever posture you want. I'm, I'm going to kneel. You can sit. You can stand. You can kneel. We're going to learn a new song today called Come to the Altar. As you learn this song and sing it with us, it is a song of confession. It is a song of forgiveness. It is a song of repentance. It's a song of redemption. When Jesus took the bread and he broke it, he started to give it to all of his disciples and he said this, this body, this is a symbol. This is a symbol of my body which is being broken for you. My body has to be broken so that you can be healed. My body has to be broken so your sins and your transgressions can be forgiven. The only way that your conscience can be cleansed is if my body is broken and then he turned and he gave the cup and he said this cup is a symbol of the covenant that's being ratified with God that your sins are not only forgiven, but your conscience can be cleansed. Isn't that phenomenal? First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, not only to forgive, but to cleanse. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Would you join me? Take whatever position. You can stay seated. If you want to kneel, if you want to stand, let's sing this song together. we were healed. We sang today and we've studied your word and we know that you are the God of the supernatural. 
and that you function, you rule and you reign in the miraculous. So I pray today, Lord, for anyone that has uh, their needs spiritually, emotionally, relationally, financially, vocationally, intellectually, and physically. Lord, we pray for restoration, we pray for wholeness, and we pray for healing in Jesus' name. Lord, anyone that needs their body healed today, they need one of the systems in their body or multiples healed, we just pray now for healing to flow in Jesus' name. Lord, for forgiveness, for salvation. Lord, for your wisdom and knowledge and insight and understanding. Thank you. Your body was broken so that we could be children of the living God. We thank you for that. Would you eat with me? And would you hold the cup up? Scripture says that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world. You came that justice might be upheld, that righteousness would be fulfilled. We thank you, Lord, for everyone here who has confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Their sins are forgiven. If you're here today and you've not entrusted your life into Christ's hands, I encourage you to do that today. And just simply pray, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I give my life to you. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for shedding your blood. I confess with my mouth that God raised Jesus, raised you from the dead, and that, uh, that you are the Lord. So, Lord, we thank you for salvation, and we drink in celebration in Jesus' name. Let's drink together. Thanks for watching the message. You can find more information at cbchurch.com.